the 9,115th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is maintenance of peace and security of Ukraine. The agenda is adopted. I have received a letter from the permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations requesting that His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, be invited to participate via video teleconference to, in today's meeting in accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure. Would any member wish to take the floor on this matter? I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. President. Our delegation objects to the virtual participation of the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, in today's meeting. We would like to explain our objection. We are not opposing the participation of the President of Ukraine or his representative in the meeting. I will repeat once again for protocol and for those who will try to distort our position. We do not object against the participation of the President of Ukraine in this meeting. However, this participation must be in person. In other words, he must be physically present in the Council Chamber. This isn't a whim in our part. These are the rules that govern the work of the Council. This isn't about politics. It is purely a procedural matter. It is also a matter of respect for the members of the Council and for the Council as a body. Indeed, when the world was facing the coronavirus pandemic, we collectively decided that we would continue working virtually. But all of our meetings via VTC, according to our collective decision, were informal meetings. Then, after returning to the Council Chamber after the peak of the pandemic, we decided that the Council would resume its normal working patterns, which meant a return to the provisional rules of procedure as well. In other words, if we, the members of the Security Council, are sitting here in the room, other member states participating under Rule 37 must be present here as well. Mr. Zelensky has already spoken to the Council twice via VTC. Each time we expressed our negative view of this in writing but the Western members of the Council explained back then and assured us in writing, including the President that invited the President of Ukraine, that this was an exception that would not create a precedent. A precedent is not created after a first or second time, but a third time is no longer an exception. We would like to remind those members of the Council who presided or will preside in the Council that they and we have already encountered such cases. We can understand making a few exceptions when we had just returned to the chamber after the pandemic when it was still preventing the heads of certain states from traveling. However, this year, our presidency in February, as well as other presidents, did not allow high-ranking representatives of member states to speak under Rule 37 via VTC. So why should there be double standards in the Council on this matter? Why do other heads of state or ministers of other countries that are on the agendas, on the Council's agenda, subjected to discrimination? This recalls the situation with international humanitarian assistance that rushed into Ukraine when people forgot helping others in other parts of the world, or the double standards on refugees and migrants in Europe when refugees from Ukraine are green-lighted in every European country, while refugees from Africa and the Middle East and other regions find themselves facing barriers. We cannot agree to make an exception for one country and one person. The meeting was announced a week in advance, and the president had the opportunity to travel to New York. We constantly see Zelensky meeting foreign delegations traveling around the country and even posing for photo shoots for glossy magazines. He is also appointed the head of the Ukrainian delegation at the 77th uh, general session of the General Assembly, something that is possible only through personal participation. From all of this, we can draw the conclusion that there are no restrictions to the president's movements. We also know that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitry Kuleba, has been actively traveling abroad. 
Moreover, today in this room, we see Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who just recently traveled to Ukraine and visited various cities there. I repeat once again that what we're objecting to here is not the participation of the head of the uh, Ukraine, but rather his participation by VTC specifically. And we ask the president to put this matter to a procedural vote. Thank you, I thank the uh, statement by the representative of the Russian Federator, uh, representative. Uh, are there other members who wish to take floor on this matter? I'll give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We listened carefully to the arguments put forward by the delegation of Russia. We disagree with them, and let me explain. We have discussed on this issue in the past, and here we are again, unfortunately, since the situation on the ground in Ukraine has not changed, has not improved. We agree that in the post-pandemic situation, participation virtually under Rule 37 should be an exception. We are faced with such a situation since a democratically elected leader of a sovereign country, a member of the United Nations, cannot leave his country for reasons beyond his control. And we all know what the reasons are. The letters of the United Kingdom, Albania and the United States, respectively of 11 April, 18 July and 19 July, have explained in detail the reasons for granting the Ukrainian president the possibility to address the Security Council virtually. Allow me to reiterate that the justification for this exception remains unchanged from the previous times when the Council agreed that the president uh, should, could address the council via VTC. It was so in April, it was so in June, and it is sadly now. Ukraine is at war under foreign invasion. When a full military attack on a country, Ukraine, remains ongoing, with Independence Day this day, with curfews imposed in various cities because of that threat, the Security Council cannot reasonably demand that the President travels to New York if he wants to participate in a session. It is therefore legitimate that we fully and, and we fully understand that in such circumstances, the situation in Ukraine requires President Zelensky to be there. This is a unique and exceptional situation at this moment in the world, and therefore for this Council as well. We therefore strongly support the participation of President Zelensky via VTC and invite other members to vote in favor. I thank you. Well, okay. I thank the representative of Albania for their statement. Are there other members who wish to speak? In view of the comments made by the council members and the request by the representative of the Russian Federation, I propose to put to the vote the following proposal to wit to extend an invitation to His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, to participate via video teleconference in today's meeting in accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure. I shall put the proposal to the vote now. Well, those in favour of the proposal to extend an invitation under Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure to His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of the Ukraine, to participate via video conference, please raise their hand. Against? Please raise your hands. Abstentions? Please raise your hands. The result of the voting is as follows. 13 votes in favour, one vote against, one abstention. The proposal to invite His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, to participate in today's meeting via VTC has been adopted. I now invite I'll give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. President. We regret that members of the Council have spoken out against 
complying with the rules of the council. We can understand the logic of Kiev's Western backers who are prepared to sacrifice the entire Ukrainian people to cover up Kiev's crimes and the work of the council as well. But we're disappointed by the fact that other members who, when they come to the council, undertake the obligation to uphold the rules of the council today, have contributed to the erosion of its very foundations and practices. We call on all member states of the UN to take note of today's situation. Despite our position, we will hear out Mr. Zelensky because we also have something to say to him as well. We hope that he will remain at today's meeting until its very conclusion, and we shall see whether or not Mr. Zelensky will be able to come to the 77th session of the General Assembly as the head of the, general, uh, the Ukrainian delegation or not, as the representative of Albania has claimed. I thank the uh, statement by the representative of the Russian Federation. I now invite President Zelensky to participate in today's meeting via VTC. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council of Provisional Rules of Procedure, I also invite His Excellency Mr. Silvio Gonzato, Charge d'Affaires, at interim of the European Union delegation to the United Nations. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two on the agenda. I am honored to invite the Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, and I give him the floor. Mr. President, Mr. President of Ukraine, Excellencies, today marks a sad and tragic milestone six months since Russia's 24th of February invasion of Ukraine. During this devastating period, thousands of civilians have been killed and injured, including hundreds of children, and countless others have lost their family members, friends, and loved ones. The world has seen grave violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law committed with little to no accountability and millions of Ukrainians have lost their homes and their worldly possessions, becoming internally displaced or refugees. With the onset of winter, humanitarian needs continue to rise rapidly with millions of people in need of assistance and protection. As these needs skyrocket, it is imperative that humanitarian actors in Ukraine have safe and unhindered access to all people require assistance, no matter where they live. Mr. President, the consequences of this senseless war are being felt far beyond Ukraine. We are seeing new vulnerabilities emerge in a global environment already worn on, out by conflicts, inequality, pandemic-induced economic and health crises, and climate change with a disproportionate impact on developing countries. The acceleration of already high food, fertilizer, and fuel prices has triggered the global crisis that could drive millions more into extreme poverty, magnifying anger and malnutrition, while threatening to raise the global humanitarian case low to new highs and erase hard-won development gains. Vulnerable communities are grappling with the largest cost of living crisis in a generation, and high commodity and transportation costs are having major repercussions for existing humanitarian operations. Mr. President, 
and the Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo will brief the Council on the impact of the armed conflict in Ukraine, both inside and outside the country, over the past six months. As I mentioned on Monday, I wanted to take this opportunity to provide a brief update on my recent travel to Ukraine. I would like uh, to have been able to do the same yesterday based on my experience in discussions about Zaporizhia, but unfortunately I was out of New York with uh, a uh, dislocation planned that was impossible to change at so, such a short notice. My visit was an important opportunity to follow up on the landmark deal that, was, that has brought a measure of hope, especially to developing countries and millions of vulnerable people bearing the brand of the global food crisis, some of them on the edge of famine. I can report to the Council that the Black Sea Grain Initiative, signed in Istanbul in July, is progressing well with dozens of ships sailing in and out of Ukrainian ports, loaded so far with over 720,000 metric tons of grains and other food products. These deals would not have been possible without the constructive approach of both Ukraine and Russia and the efforts of the government of Turkey. During my visit to Lviv, I met with Ukrainian President Zelensky and Turkish President Erdogan. I thank them for their continued engagement to support the implementation of the initiative to ensure the safe passage of Ukrainian food products and fertilizers to those in need and to the world at large. I was filled with emotion visiting the port of Odessa and the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul. On my visit to Odessa, I went aboard a bulk carrier called MV Kubrosli Y, as it was being loaded with about 10,000 metric tons of wheat. It was deeply moving to peer into the hold of this cargo ship and see wheat pouring in. Even if in a limited way, the storied port of Odessa, which had been paralyzed for months, is slowly coming to life thanks to the initiative. In Istanbul, I saw the WFP chartered ship, the MV Brave Commander. It was proudly flying the UN flag with its cargo destined for the Horn of Africa, where millions of people are at risk of famine. I then had the opportunity to walk up the long and narrow gangway of the SSI Invincible II, having to keep up Ukrainian grain in the port of Chornomorsk. The vessel will carry one of the largest hulls of grain leaving Ukraine to date, more than 50,000 metric tons. Mr. President, just a few weeks ago, much of this would have been hard to imagine. We are seeing a powerful demonstration of what can be achieved in even the most devastating contexts when we put people first. And I, I stressed in Odessa and Istanbul, what I saw was the more visible part of the solution. The other part of this package deal is the unimpeded access to global markets of Russian food and fertilizers, which are not subject to sanctions. It is critical that all governments and the private sector cooperate to effectively bring them to market. Together with the task team led by Rebecca Greenspan, I will continue my intense contacts for that purpose. In 2022, there is enough food in the world. The problem is its uneven distribution. But if we don't stabilize the fertilizer market in 2022, there simply will not be enough food in 2023. Many farmers around the world are already planning to reduce areas for cultivation for next season. Getting much more food and fertilizers out of Ukraine and Russia at reasonable cost is vital to further calm commodity markets and lower prices for consumers. I once again commend the parties for their engagement in this process and urge them to continue to build on this progress. I also renew the call I made in Odessa for a massive scaling up of support to the developing countries getting hammered by the global food crisis. The shipment of grain and other foodstuffs is crucial, but it won't mean much if countries cannot afford them. Developed countries and international financial institutions 
must do more to ensure that developing countries can fully capitalize on the opportunities of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Mr. President, despite progress on the humanitarian front, fighting in Ukraine shows no signs of ending, with new potential areas of dangerous escalation appearing. Two places were ever present in my mind and in my discussions in Ukraine, Zaporizhia and Oranivka. I remain gravely concerned about the situation in and around Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia. The warning lights are flashing. Any actions that might endanger the physical integrity, safety or security of the nuclear plant are simply unacceptable. Any further escalation of the situation could lead to self-destruction. The security of the plant must be ensured and the plant must be reestablished as purely civilian infrastructure. In close contact with the IAEA, the UN Secretariat has assessed that we have in Ukraine the logistics and security capacity to support any IAEA mission to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant from Kyiv, provided both Russia and Ukraine agree. And I welcome expressions of support for such a mission and urge that to happen as soon as possible. Mr. President, I am deeply disturbed by the allegations of violations of international humanitarian law and violations and abuses of human rights related to the armed conflict. International humanitarian law protects prisoners of war. The International Committee of the Red Cross must have access to them wherever they are held. The United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine and the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine continue to monitor, document, and report with a view to supporting the investigation of alleged violations. Worse is also ongoing to deploy the recently established fact-finding mission to Olevnivka to look into the incident on 29 July. This mission must be able to freely conduct its work, to gather and analyze necessary information, and to find the facts. It is imperative that the mission has safe, secure, and unfettered access to all relevant places and persons, and to all relevant evidence without any limitation, impediment, or interference. Mr. President, Excellencies, on this 31st anniversary of Ukraine's independence, I wish to congratulate the Ukrainian people. The people of Ukraine and beyond need peace, and they need peace now. Peace in line with the UN Charter, peace in line with international law, and I thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his introductory remarks. I now give the floor to Ms. DiCarlo. Mr. President, on 23 February 2022, this chamber heard impassioned pleas to avert a war in Ukraine, to no avail. Today, exactly six months later, there is no end in sight to the conflict triggered by the Russian Federation's invasion. As we meet, the heaviest fighting is concentrated in the eastern Donbas region, in the south near Kherson in Zaporizhia, and in the northeast near Kharkiv. But virtually all corners of Ukraine are affected, and no one is out of reach of missile strikes. At the same time, several attacks, conducted mainly with drones, have also been reported in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, Ukraine, occupied by the Russian Federation since 2014. Mr. President, civilians are paying a heavy price in this war. During the past 181 days, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has recorded 13,560 civilian casualties, 5,614 killed, and 7,946 injured. These figures are based on verified incidents. Actual numbers are considerably higher. The majority of civilian casualties were caused by explosive weapons with wide area effects. The use of these weapons in and around populated areas has predictable and devastating consequences. To date, OHCHR has documented damage, destruction, or use for military purposes of 249 medical facilities and 350 educational facilities. 
actual figures may be higher. The indiscriminate shelling and bombing of populated areas, killing civilians and wrecking hospitals, schools, and other civilian infrastructure are actions that may amount to war crimes. Mr. President, we continue to receive reports of human rights violations, the arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance of civilians including local authorities, journalists, civil society activists, and other civilians, continues. OHCHR has documented 327 cases of arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance of civilians by the Russian Federation and affiliated armed groups in non-government controlled territory. OHCHR has also recorded 39 arbitrary arrests in Ukrainian government-controlled territory and 28 other cases they may amount to enforced disappearance. 14 victims of enforced disappearances perpetrated by the Russian Federation and affiliated armed groups were found dead or died while in detention, 13 men and one woman. OHCHR has also corroborated allegations of hundreds of willful killings of civilians while par parts of Kyiv Chernihiv and Sumy regions were under Russian control in February to March 2022. It has also verified 43 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, the majority attributable to Russian armed forces. Mr. President, we're also concerned about the situation of prisoners of war on both sides. All prisoners of war are protected under international humanitarian law. There's a need for unimpeded and confidential access by the International Committee of the Red Cross to all places of detention, including to places of internment of Ukrainian prisoners of war and civilian detainees in the Russian Federation. We are concerned by reports that the Russian Federation and affiliated armed groups in Donetsk are planning to try Ukrainian prisoners of war in a so-called international tribunal in Mariupol. Any tribunal must respect the protections afforded to all prisoners of war by international law, including fair trial guarantees. The failure to uphold these standards could amount to a war crime. Mr. President, humanitarian needs continue to rise rapidly. At least 17.7 .7 million people, or 40% of the Ukrainian population, need humanitarian assistance and protection including 3.3 million children. Humanitarian access is of great concern. Roads are heavily contaminated with explosive ordnance, putting civilians at risk and stopping humanitarian convoys from reaching them. Over 6.6 .6 million internally displaced persons have been recorded. Another 6.7 million people have left Ukraine to other countries in Europe, most of them women and children. Mr. President, as winter approaches, the destruction caused by war, combined with the lack of access to fuel or electricity due to damaged infrastructure, could become a matter of life or death if people are unable to heat their homes. An estimated 1.7 million people are already in need of urgent assistance with heating, shelter repair, and other winterization preparation as temperatures in parts of the country are expected to decline to minus 20 degrees Celsius. The UN's ongoing winterization efforts aim to complement and support the work led by the government of Ukraine. Our revised flash appeal requires $4.3 billion to support 17.7 .7 million people in need of assistance through December 2022. Donors have generously provided $2.4 billion as of 19 August. The humanitarian response has scaled up to 500 humanitarian organization partners reaching over 11.8 million people with at least one form of assistance. The war has severely impacted agriculture in Ukraine, leaving thousands of farmers without income, destroying grain storage facilities and exacerbating food insecurity among vulnerable groups. According to the World Food Program, 20% of the people of Ukraine have insufficient food. As the Sec Mr. President, as the Secretary General emphasized, the repercussions of the war in Ukraine are being felt worldwide. According to World Food Program estimates, 345 million people 
will be acutely food insecure or at a high risk of food insecurity in 82 countries with a WFP operational presence. This represents an increase of 47 million acutely hungry people due to the riffle effects of the war in Ukraine. Last month, UNDP estimated that up to 71 million people may have already been pushed into poverty in the three months after the start of the war. Key affected areas include the Balkans, the Caspian Sea region, and Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly the Sahel. The global financial situation remains volatile with concerns about potential stagflation scenarios in the latter part of 2022 and 2023. Energy markets remain under stress, a serious concern as the winter season in the Northern Hemisphere approaches. While food prices have stabilized in recent weeks, this is not necessarily translated into lower inflation rates yet. Inflation continued to accelerate in July of this year. It is breaking multi-decade records in developed countries, and yet it is developing countries and LDCs that have been more drastically affected. The fiscal situation in many developing economies is a particular concern, particularly as their borrowing ability has been fragile following the need to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic with significant expenditures. Today, developing country debts and import bills are coming under further pressure. We remain concerned that the deteriorating socioeconomic situation in developing countries, particularly those in already fragile situations, could lead to social unrest. While it is difficult to establish a direct link to the war, we have already seen an increase in the number of riots between the first and second quarter of 2022. Mr. President, today's grim six-month anniversary coincides with Ukraine's National Day. This is an occasion to celebrate the country's sovereignty and independence and proud heritage. And we congratulate the people of Ukraine on this day. But let us recall that the human and material toll of this war is tragic, colossal, and evident. First and foremost, for Ukraine and its people. And the economic consequences for the world are ominous and growing. The conflict is having another impact that although less tangible, is just as perilous. In deepening global divisions and exacerbating mistrust in our institutions, the war is weakening the foundations of our international system. The consequences of a breakdown and how the world manages questions of peace and security are frightening to contemplate. This war is not only senseless, but exceedingly dangerous, and it touches all of us. It must end. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Ms. DiCarlo for her statement. I now invite the, His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, to uh, I give him the floor. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for this support and greetings from the independent and free Ukraine for the fight for its Russian terror. Just uh, recently, as I was preparing for this statement, I've received information that Russia has launched missiles against the Dnipropetrovsk region, against the railroad station, the railroad car cars at the station. People and 50 people uh, were uh, injured. Unfortunately, the death toll could increase. This is the, our life every day. This is how Russia got prepared for this uh, UN session. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, Mr. General Secretary, UN, all those the UN Charter. Today, our country celebrates the day, the Independence Day. And now everyone of you can see how much in the world is dependent on our independence and whether Ukraine is at peace, whether our people are safe, whether the integrity of our territory and the availability of our borders are guaranteed. It can take any aspect of this terrible 
against us. And each of these aspects will be related to one or another global crisis. Now, what is happening right now? Russia has put the world on the brink of a radiation catastrophe. It is a fact that the Russian military has turned the territory of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, into a war zone. This is a fact. The Russia's armed provocation, shelling, deployment of terrorists on the territory of the station under the Russian flag. Now, Europe and neighboring regions face the threat of the radiation pollution. This is a fact. Now, what is the Chernobyl? The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has six reactors. Only one reactor exploded in Chernobyl. The IAEA mission should take permanent control of the situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant as soon as possible. And Russia should unconditionally stop nuclear blackmail and completely withdraw from the station. Russia has on the hunger. It is a fact that Russian blockade of, of Ukrainian ports and Azov increased the deficit in the already destabilized food market. And this is a situation in different parts of our planet, let alone the drought in Europe, the largest over the last uh, 500 years. Fortunately, we've managed to create Russia was forced to accept the terms of international community, allowing to restore grain export from three Ukrainian ports. It relieves a part of the tension in the food market, but does not remove the threat completely. Only the full recovery of Ukrainian agricultural experts without any obstacles can be a guarantee that tens of millions of people around the world would have something to eat. And um, aren't you feel resent to the fact that even now in the 21st century, you still have to fight to save tens of millions of people in different countries from this artificial hunger, this artificial one, which was provoked by a single country with its insane aggression. And that's also a fact. Ukraines do feel that. The UN was established not to debate in the 21st century over the aspects that should have long remained in the past. But nevertheless, I thank Mr. Gen Secretary General of the UN and the Turkey Year and to the President of the Turkey Year and to all other responsible members of international relations who are fighting against the food crisis to which only Russia is responsible. In the coming weeks, we have to do everything to expand the existing grain initiative. Let's take another aspect, the energy. It is a fact that Russia is deliberately trying to impose energy poverty upon tens of millions of people, deprive them of normal access to basic goods by deliberately raising energy prices. All this is done by a permanent member to the UN Security Council who still uses the privilege of its veto right. The energy crisis for Europe, the threat of large-scale hunger, the political chaos for African and Asian countries, the price crisis in the whole world, isn't it too much for a single country whose representative sits among you? I will mention one more aspect, the values. Indeed, we should honestly talk about the point that values are perceived differently in different parts of the world. There's different approaches, but everywhere in the world, life has value. Peace has value. Economic prosperity has value. All countries, if they respect themselves and their people, punish for murder and not honor the executioners. However, we see that there is a country that is not, behaves differently and is proud of uh, doing so. It rewards murderers and encourages executioners. And this is a threat not only for Ukraine, thousands of Ukrainians were killed by the Russian invaders. Dozens of our cities were destroyed by Russian artillery. Russia 
does not comply with fundamental conventions on the prisoners of war. This is something that was also mentioned today. The deliberate killing by the Russian occupiers of our prisoners of war in Olenivka became one of the most terrible pages in the history of Europe. And there is an immediate need for a UN fact-finding mission in Olenivka, and the mandate of which should be extended to cover all Ukrainian POWs currently held by Russian forces. There is no such war crime that the Russian occupiers have not yet committed on the territory of Ukraine. But if Russia is not stopped now and in Ukraine, if it is not stopped by the victory of Ukraine, then all these Russian murderers will inevitably end up in other countries, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America. There are traces of Russian war criminals everywhere, and we must all get united and act decisively as soon as possible. So there are no more traces of Russian missiles and no more cities burned by Russian artillery so that there would be no threat of a radiation catastrophe every, ever again. Russia must release the captured territory of Ukraine so that there would be no food crisis. Russia would need to withdraw from our land, from our sea, so that no country in the world can ever again disregard the UN and uh, conventions binding on all mankind. Ru there's no... Ex Russia must be held accountable for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. The relevant resolution will be submitted for the consideration of the 77th session of the UN General Assembly. In order for a sense of justice to return to international relations, we must all confirm and force Russia to recognize that the inviolability of borders and peace are unconditional values for all nations. This is why the independence and integrity of our country are of fundamental importance for the international relations, preserving our independence, guaranteeing returning normal economic ties with Ukraine will restore the true power to the UN Charter and save the world from the crises that we're all forced to face now. Mr. General Secretary, Antonio Guterres has the ambitious intention of organizing the summit of the future next year. We support this initiative and reaffirm that in order to build the future, it's necessary to leave in the dustbin of history what has always prevented humanity from leaving in peace, namely the aggression and colonial ambitions. That is what Russia has came with to Ukraine, and I believe that we can surely build the future. That would be good and symbolic to have this summit in Ukraine. It is on the territory of Ukraine that the world's future is decided, whether we will have a future at all. This is being decided also at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and in our seaports and in Donbas and in the Crimea, our independence is your security. The security of the entire for this opportunity, for the understanding of my situation, for the situation of our country. Thank you for the attention. And I thank the Chinese presidency to participate in this session in the online format. Glory to you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Zelensky for his statement. I now give the floor to the members of the Security Council. I give the floor to the representative of the U.S. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Secretary General Guterres and Under Secretary General DiCarlo for your briefings. I would also like to congratulate Ukrainians on their Independence Day and thank President Zelensky for participating in this meeting today. President Zelensky, the United States stands with you and the people of Ukraine today and every day. And every Russian bomb that falls only strengthens our resolve to support 
your sovereignty and your independence. Today marks six months of Russia's premeditated, unjustifiable, and brutal full-scale war against Ukraine. Just six months since we, sitting here in the council chamber, watched as Russia, serving in the presidency, attempted to defend the indefensible. Six months of Russia's defiance of the international community. Six months of Russia's flagrant lies and disregard for international law, including violations of the UN Charter. Six months of attacks by Russia, killing Ukrainian civilians and destroying civilian, civilian infrastructure. Six months of devastation and missile strikes that have torn apart families and stolen the lives of too many, like the life of four-year-old Lisa Dmitrieva, killed last month in a missile strike that left 24 people dead. Six months of horrific atrocities, including rape, murder, and torture in towns like Bucha and Irpin and others. Six months of families being separated and millions displaced. Six months of killings, thousands dead. Six months later, Russia's goal is as clear as ever, to dismantle Ukraine as a geopolitical entity and erase it from the world world map. Russian disinformation campaigns are increasingly being weaponized to prepare for further attempts to annex Ukrainian territory. Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs Lavrov publicly acknowledged this as one of the Kremlin's objectives. Specifically, Russia is laying groundwork to attempt to annex the regions of Kherson and Zaporizhia and all of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Let's be clear. The international community will never recognize Russia's attempt to change Ukraine's borders by force. And when the world's leaders come to New York next month to reaffirm their commitments to the UN Charter, they are also reaffirming their support for that basic principle. So no matter how many more sham referendums, illegitimate authorities Moscow tries to install, we will continue to defend the UN Charter and uphold Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence. And as we discussed yesterday, Russia is responsible for creating another grave risk to another core commitment by the international community to nuclear safety. Ukraine had an impeccable record of nuclear energy safety and security at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. But Russia recklessly attacked and seized control of this plant by force, risking nuclear disaster. In a similar vein, we are particularly concerned by Russia's so-called filtration operations, which involve the systematic forced deportations of Ukrainian civilians to remote areas of Russia. These camps are abducting and separating children from their parents. Russian forces are forcibly confiscating and replacing passports, dictating curriculums in schools, and replacing Ukrainian street names and other public signs with Russian language alternatives. The evidence of Russian forces interrogating, detaining, and forcibly deporting hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, including children, continue to mount. The reasons are clear. They want to destroy Ukraine, its culture, its people, its very existence. Even where we have seen progress, like the movement of grain and other foodstuff from Ukrainian ports following the much needed arrangement signed with Turkey, Russia did not let us forget about its intentions. Mere hours, hours after the deal was inked, Russia launched missiles at the port of Odessa. 
those missiles were a potent reminder. Millions of Ukrainians are still under siege and tens of millions around the world are being driven to hunger by Russia's actions. For all this violence and carnage, these hunger and humanitarian crises, these human rights abuses and threats to vulnerable groups, Russia and Russia alone bears sole responsibility. And Russia alone is the sole hindrance to a swift resolution to this crisis. We must continue to call for and ensure accountability for all of Russia's atrocities. Today marks six months of the war, but it also marks Ukraine's Independence Day, a day normally celebrated by parades with festivals with joy. Many of us came together in a similar kind of celebration on July 4th last month on the UN lawn as America celebrated its independence. And we ate and we danced and we looked in awe at the fireworks in the sky. In Ukraine today, there are none of the typical festivals, no feasts or concerts. Citizens have been told to stay away from cities and to look for very different kinds of explosions from the sky. And we heard President Zelensky describe just that to us today. One Ukrainian citizen told an NPR reporter that she hopes that, and I'll quote her, she hopes that we can celebrate independence without weapons in the future, maybe with flowers and dances instead. Let us do everything we can to bring the flowers and the dances back to Kyiv, back to Ukrainians. And let us pray by this time next year, her dream has come true. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the U.S. for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. And let me also thank the ESG and USG Di Carlo for their update information. 31 years ago today, Ukraine declared its independence from the decaying Soviet Union. It is a day to celebrate, and I'm sure, despite the situation, Ukrainians in Ukraine and abroad will proudly mark their day in a way or another. We join them in this and welcome you, President Zelensky, in this meeting under the exceptional circumstances you and your country continue to endure. But celebrations are not easy and hardly joyful when you are under attack by your neighbor that pretends from dawn to dusk to be your brother. But that kind of brother that is assaulting you, killing your people, destroying your homes, bombarding your cities, abusing your women, deporting your people, breaking your country, denying your existence. That abusive brother that wants to take everything you have. Mr. President, today marks also exactly six months from the start of the invasion, the day when the UN Charter was thrown in the Kremlin shredder, when the term respect for international law lost any meaning in Moscow. It marks 27 weeks from the adoption of the United Nations General Assembly resolution when the whole world but four asked Russia to stop the war and respect the sovereignty of Ukraine. It marks 25 weeks from a legally binding order of the International Court of Justice, the highest international court addressed to Russia to immediately stop military activities. All these calls and documents continue to be ignored. Russia persists in its course with a clear intention to dismantle Ukraine and subjugate its people. Despite unquestionable evidence and hard proof that its actions have and continue to produce serious global destabilizing effects on security, energy, food, including the risk of a nuclear catastrophe, and are increasingly decoupling Russia from the rest of the European continent. We welcome, Tur we commend Turkey and the Secretary General for their tireless and successful efforts in making sure that grain and other food products are exported from Ukraine and go on the tables of the needy throughout the world. Colleagues, the war is having a terrible negative impact on everything in Ukraine and beyond. 
but hardly anything compares with the devastating impact on civilians in general and their children in particular, the future generation. Some 1,000 children, maybe more, will not be there to see the liberated Ukraine. They have been killed, five every day. 5.2 million are in need of humanitarian assistance. 3.6 million have been affected by the closure of schools or by the impact of attack on schools, which will continue to delay the children's return to in-person learning. Many more millions are left with invisible wounds that must be addressed without delay to prioritize children's mental health and psychological needs and help them build resilience. If there were one single reason to put an immediate end to this war, it is this, to save children, the future generations from the scourge of war as it is written in our constitution. Mr. President, a few weeks ago, a deadly explosion killed 53 Ukrainian prisoners of war held in Ukraine territory under the Russian control. This tragic event is still not independently elucidated and for, as for everything of that nature, we are told that Ukraine did it. Prisoners of war should have been protected by law as well as by the guarantees given to the UN and the International Committee for Red Cross that the Azov detainees would be properly treated. Unfortunately, 53 of them were killed. We welcome the appointment of the investigation team by the Secretary General. We strongly ask the UN to do everything to make sure that the investigation is done impartially and on the UN terms. Those responsible for such despicable crimes must be held accountable. Mr. President, with the regular army stretched thin after six months of a disastrous and bloody invasion of Ukraine, there is increasing in evidence that the Kremlin is making dreadful choices and recruiting Russia's prisoners to fight. Credible reports and meticulous, and meticulous investigations point into that direction. This is very worrying in a situation that is already alarming since when we have seen what regular soldiers were able to execute in Bucha, we have shivers thinking about what may happen when you give weapons to murderers and criminals who should be behind bars in Russia and not in Ukraine in military uniform. These new fighters, if that proves true, will fill in for those who have come to senses, discovered the truth and abandoned the war, not to continue to be partners in crime, like Pavel Filatiev. He was sent to Kursen. He is free to speak his mind now and tell his story. And what is he saying? Let me quote. We understood that we were dragged into a serious conflict where we are simply destroying towns and not actually liberating anyone. We do not see any reason that our government is trying to explain to us. All of it is a lie. We are just destroying peaceful lives, end of quote. His account is much longer, 141 pages, out there in the open for everyone to read the immense despair of someone sent to commit crimes next door. Mr. President, we have warned before and wish to reiterate, particularly on this day, any territory, territory annexation, any development incompatible with the Ukraine constitution imposed by Russia, such as sham elections or referendums à la Russe, will not be accepted, will not be recognized. For Russian officials in the territories under Russian control speak openly of joining Russia by implementing the Crimea template. This will be null and void a dead end. As stated by key European leaders as recently as yesterday, Ukraine friends are ready to support Ukraine's fight to defend itself, not because anyone is against Russia and the Russians, but simply because all those who are for peace see in Ukraine the litmus test of the European security architecture and the stress test of resilience of world peace and security in front of long gone imperial behavior. Colleagues, on this day, we reaffirm once more our full and unwavering solidarity with the people of Ukraine. We pay tribute to all those who are fighting to defend their land and their lives, and to all those sacrificed for the independence and freedom of Ukraine. We reiterate our support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, and we call on Russia to stop the war, withdraw its troops, and change course so that next year, at this time, there is a real happy parade in Kyiv 
not the one with the burnt out or abundant husks of Russian military equipment, the epitome of this senseless war. And I thank you. Uh, I thank the representative of Albania for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Thank you to the Secretary General and Ms. DiCarlo for their briefings. And I would also like to welcome the briefing provided by President Zelensky this morning. Mr. President, for exactly six months now, Ukrainians have courageously resisted the war of aggression launched by Russia with its horrific toll of mass suffering and abuse. Need we recall that Ukrainians are fighting for their sovereignty and the territorial integrity of their country. What better time to pay tribute than today, the day of their national holiday, which in 1991 marked the independence of Ukraine? Through its struggle, Ukraine is also defending the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, and that is why France will continue to stand by its side. With our European partners, we will continue to support Ukraine as long as is necessary in the face of Russian aggression. On this day when Ukrainian independence is celebrated, let me say clearly again that France will never recognize the annexation of territories occupied by the Russian Federation. France will not recognize the legitimacy of independent referenda organized by Russia in these territories in an attempt to legitimize its aggression and camouflage its flagrant violations of international law, nor have we ever recognized nor will we ever recognize the annexation of Crimea. Mr. President, with this war, Russia is further destabilizing the world, already grappling with serious threats. We welcome the fact that the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul is now operational and that 33 vessels have been able to leave Ukrainian ports since the signing of the Istanbul Accords. But let us not delude ourselves. The negative fallout of the war led by Russia is ongoing and is getting worse. Supply chains are still disrupted. Transportation costs remain very high. The energy markets are crippled. As long as Russian aggression persists, the fallout will continue to spread. The presence of Russian troops on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant also heightens the risk of a nuclear accident with potentially devastating consequences. We recall our appeal for the withdrawal of Russian forces. Any incident would be the primary responsibility of Russia, and it is crucial for the IAEA to be able to conduct expert missions on the ground as soon as possible. Mr. President, the information we have received about extrajudicial executions, acts of torture against pr Ukrainian prisoners, in particular in the Olenivka village, but not just there, beyond it as well, is shocking. Let us repeat, Russia must respect international humanitarian law that applies in all international armed conflicts, whether or not it acknowledges being at war, as well as international human rights law. France, along with its partners, rallied in the initial days of Russian aggression to ensure that the authors of crimes committed in Ukraine would be identified, found, and their crimes documented. We actively support the work of the International Criminal Court investigating crime uh, acts which may constitute war crimes, crimes of genocide, or crimes against humanity. We also support investigations of Ukrainian jurisdictions. We will follow closely the upcoming publication by the International Independent uh, Commission of Inquiry created by the Human Rights Council with the support of France. Once again, we call upon Russia to choose diplomacy to rebuild peace with Ukraine, to recognize its sovereignty and territorial integrity in internationally recognized borders at the time and under the conditions determined by Ukrainians, which are, is the victim of aggression. France will continue to commit itself to that end. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for the statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would like to thank the Secretary General for his remarks and indeed his efforts with regards to resolving the war in Ukraine and its wider consequences, including for global food security. I also thank USG Di Carlo for her briefing, and I want to welcome President Zelensky's address to the Council and reiterate Ireland's unwavering friendship and support to the people of Ukraine on the occasion of their Independence Day. Mr. President, it is eight and a half years since Russia first violated the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. It is six months 
to the day since Russia launched its further illegal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, violating and attacking the core principles of this United Nations. Yet let us be clear, the internationally recognised borders of Ukraine have not changed in the last six months, nor in the last eight and a half years. The decision by Ukraine to invade, the decision by Russia to invade Ukraine has not changed those borders. They did not change in 2014, and they have not changed in 2022. Neither will unilateral steps by Russia to integrate parts of Ukraine be recognised for anything other than flagrant violations of the principles of sovereign independence and non-intervention, and a bold attempt to entrench a supposed sphere of influence. We also condemn the dangerous, escalatory and unacceptable nuclear rhetoric by Russia during this conflict. Mr. President, for 183 days, Ireland has called for an end to the unjustified and unjustifiable war being waged against Ukraine. As each day passes, reports of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law by Russia grow. Civilians in Ukraine continue to pay the highest price. For six months, they have been living under terror, not knowing when and where the next bomb will strike. We therefore once again call on Russia to comply with his obligations under international law. Party to the conflict must comply with international humanitarian law. They have an obligation to distinguish between civilians and combatants and not to attack civilian objects. There is a prohibition against indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks and an obligation to take all feasible precautions in attack. And compliance is not optional. Mr. President, as I said yesterday at our meeting, Ireland remains extremely concerned by the situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the serious risk of a radiological accident or incident arising from military activity at the site with devastating consequences. We call on Russia to end its illegal occupation of the site, withdraw its troops and munitions, and ensure that the Ukrainian authorities can uphold their responsibilities for safety and security at the site. We welcome reports that a visit by the IAEA could go ahead soon and support the Secretary General's call for the plant to remain connected to the Ukrainian power grid. Mr. President, once again, we call on Russia to end its brutal war and withdraw its troops from the entire internationally recognized territory of Ukraine and to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbors. Russia can end its aggression if it chooses. But even while it chooses to execute its illegal war, it still has obligations under international law and it must comply with those obligations. We note this morning the comments from the Secretary General and the UN Secretary and the Under Secretary General on humanitarian need, particularly in the face of the onset of winter. Russia's aggression continues to cause mounting hardship and suffering for the people of Ukraine who have shown remarkable resilience and resolve. Today, Ireland stands in full solidarity with them. Thank you. I thank the uh, representative of Ireland for their statement. I'll give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, Mr. President. Russia's war in Ukraine is affecting us all. It is an attack on democratic values and on freedom. It's causing a global food crisis, and it's a blatant violation of international law and the very principles of the UN Charter. To President Zelensky, thank you for your strong testimony this morning and for the heroic fight you and the Ukrainian people are engaged in for your country and for peace and freedom of us all. Today we mark the Ukrainian Declaration of Independence in 1991. And here we are 31 years later because the Soviet successor state Russia has invaded Ukraine. It's truly tragic. So we reiterate our unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. USG Di Carlo, thank you for your uh, thorough and thoughtful briefing. And Secretary General, thank you for your briefing, including on your important recent visit to Ukraine. Norway applauds your crucial role in the Black Sea Grain Initiative and your further tireless efforts to alleviate the consequences of this horrible war and to restore peace. 
precedent, Norway condemns the Russian military aggression in the strongest terms possible. Russia's warfare in urban and populated areas and the use of heavy explosive weapons is destroying homes, schools, and hospitals. And the ongoing attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure, including nuclear power plants, is having a devastating and unacceptable impact. Thousands of civilians have already been killed. Millions have fled their homes. Others are trapped in war zones. We stand with the people all over Ukraine who continue to live in daily fear of the next attack. And we reiterate our demand that civilians must be protected and international humanitarian law and international human rights law fully respected and implemented. Humanitarian actors must be ensured access. Russia must stop the war and fully immediately and unconditionally withdraw its forces and military equipment from Ukraine. Russia started the war in Ukraine. It can choose to stop it. It seems clear that war crimes are being committed. These cannot be forgotten. Perpetrators on all levels must be held accountable. President, the Secretary General has talked about the beacon of hope with the resumption of Ukrainian grain exports. We are encouraged that a critical transportation line from a global breadbasket might be restored. It is much needed for Ukrainians as well as the world's most vulnerable people and countries. And it is critical that the World Food Programme and other humanitarian actors again can purchase grain from Ukraine for humanitarian food assistance. It is now vital that the Black Sea Grain Initiative is fully implemented. President, the accumulated effects on the war are felt by more people every day. In May, this Council expressed its unified support for the efforts of the Secretary General in the search for a peaceful solution. We must continue to support the Secretary General in his efforts for dialogue and mediation between the parties in the search for peace and freedom for the people of Ukraine. And we stress the joint responsibility of the members of this Council to make every effort to ensure peace. Again, to the Ukrainian people, our thoughts are with you on your national day and every other day. We reiterate our solidarity with you. I thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. On behalf of the United Kingdom, I thank the Secretary General and Under Secretary General Di Carlo for their briefings. We warmly welcome President Zelensky's participation in today's meeting. Six months ago, even as this Council met late into the night to try to avert catastrophe, Russia launched an unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine in violation of the UN Charter. In the months that followed, Ukraine has been subjected to the full horrors of war. As we've heard today, thousands of civilians have been killed or wounded. Over 17 million are now in need of humanitarian assistance. Schools, hospitals, and other medical facilities have been attacked. We have seen a pattern of Russian violations of international humanitarian law and of Russian human rights abuses and violations, including reports of torture, inhumane treatment, and arbitrary detention. Ukrainian citizens, including children, have been forcibly deported to Russia. Six million people are displaced within Ukraine, and over six million are refugees abroad. And the people of Ukraine are not the only victims of this war. Beyond Ukraine's borders, Putin's decisions have had a devastating impact on the world's most vulnerable, with many millions across the world affected by rising food and fuel prices. We again pay tribute to the work of the UN Secretary General with Turkey to negotiate the Black Sea Grain Initiative. 
President, today, in what would be another violation of the UN Charter, there are reports that Russia is planning fake referenda to illegally annex more territory from Ukraine. Any such attempt would fool no one. Russia has, after all, lied throughout their illegal invasion, using disinformation to create false pretexts, undermine Ukrainian sovereignty, obscure the truth, and hide war crimes. And it would further demonstrate Russia's contempt for the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, principles which, as member states of this organization, we have all committed to upholding. President, 31 years ago today, Ukraine declared its independence, with over 90% of Ukrainians voting in favor. Today, that pride in Ukrainian identity and sovereignty remains as strong as ever. We have all seen the courage and ingenuity of the Ukrainian people as they have fought to de defend their nation against Russia's attack on their national sovereignty and right to self-determination. Ukraine's fight is a fight for the principles of the UN Charter. All of us in this chamber have a responsibility to recognize that. It is a fight that has inspired the world with its courage and defiance against brutality. So today, on Ukrainian Independence Day, we stand together with the nation of Ukraine and its heroic people who continue to resist Russia's attempts to rewrite international borders by force. We once again call for Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine immediately, and we call for full accountability for Russia's crimes. Thank you. I thank the representative of the UK for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. I acknowledge the participation in the session of His Excellency, President Zelensky, to whom I extend congratulations on the occasion of Ukraine's National Day. I thank the Secretary General and USG Rosemary Di Carlo for their remarks. Six months after the opening of hostilities, there seems to be no solution in sight for the conflict in Ukraine. The situation is now compounded by the risk of nuclear disaster. It is essential that the parties refrain from attacks that could threaten the safety of nuclear facilities, as has been happening in the vicinity of the Zaporizhia plant. Brazil reiterates the call for the two sides to facilitate the access of an IAEA mission so that the conditions of the plant can be properly evaluated. It is deeply saddening to note how little progress has been made towards a political solution. The most notable result was the initiative on grain exports from Ukrainian ports and on facilitating Russian grain and fertilizer exports announced in July, for which we are grateful to the efforts of the Secretary General and the support of the government of Turkey. When the parties engaged in negotiations, an important result was achieved, which partly alleviates the effects of the conflict on food prices around the world, and particularly in developing countries. Mr. President, reality and history show that closing the door to dialogue is not the right approach to resolving any, any conflict, and this applies to Ukraine. Actions that prolong the hostilities will only result in greater human suffering and will not resolve the underlying causes. Brazil welcomes the Secretary General's efforts to ensure the implementation of the Istanbul Agreements and takes note of his visit to the region last week. It is essential that the international community seek to preserve this important achievement, which indicates a possible path towards broader negotiations. 
we urge the parties to keep open the channels of dialogue that made possible the Istanbul package as they offer the best prospects for peace. Finally, we recall the obligation of both sides under international humanitarian law to protect the civilian population and prevent human rights abuses. Attacks against residential areas and facilities such as schools, churches and hospitals are unacceptable and fuel a logic of retaliation that must be avoided by all means. It is in everyone's interest that the two countries can live peacefully, side by side in the future and cooperate to achieve the development goals. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Brazil for his statement. I'll give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and Under Secretary General Rosemary De Carlo for their respective briefings. I welcome the participation of President of Ukraine in today's meeting. Mr. President, as the war in Ukraine enters its seventh month, my hearts are full of compassion for all the civilian victims since the beginning of the conflict. We express our solidarity with the survivors, among whom are many women, children, and older persons, displaced persons and refugees whose daily lives have been upturned. We pay tribute to the humanitarian personnel who work on the ground to alleviate the atrocities of daily life for survivors of the war by providing vital precious aid, often in difficult conditions. In addition to the human toll of the war, there is a very heavy material toll, images of the destruction of public buildings, communications, and public service distribution channels have become daily occurrences. Bombardments targeting nuclear facilities, of which the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has become symbolic, create the risk of nuclear catastrophe. This is a risk that increases with the further development of military activity around this site. There is an urgent need for military activity around nuclear facilities to cease and for warring parties to refrain from any action that could put the world at risk of a nuclear catastrophe with irreparable consequences. We reiterate our appeal to the parties to comply with the nuclear safety rules in force and to cooperate with the IAEA to secure potentially dangerous sites in order to prevent the risk of disaster. We welcome recent announcements indicating the willingness of the party, parties to allow a mission of IAEA experts visit the Zaporizhia power plant in order to avoid any conflagration. We reiterate our opposition to the war and our outrage at attacks on civilians. We will not tire of repeating that the parties to the conflict must respect the international commitments they have entered into under international humanitarian law. Mr. President, the most recent update from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights reports 13,477 civilian casualties, including 5,587 killed and 7,890 injured. A large number of civilians, including children, are maimed by explosive weapons with a large impact area and indiscriminate effects. For as long as the fighting continues, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine and surrounding countries will continue to deteriorate. It is hard to predict the extent of the physical and psychological repercussions that will result, let alone the economic consequences whose shockwaves continue to spread. Mr. President, for seven months, this, this council has been plagued by unprecedented fragmentation. It has been living to the rhythm of invectives of one camp against the other, while towns and villages are ravaged and women, men, and children are being scarred by a bloody war. Our mandate 
is to stop wars, if not to prevent them. It is urgent for us to come together around our mandate and the purpose of this council. Faced with the hopeless logic of confrontation and antagonism, my country will continue to choose the side of peace, negotiation, and dialogue. We must have activate the channels of dialogue. That This is the unwavering position of my country, which since the beginning of the hostilities has stood in favor of consultations as the preferred method of resolving conflicts. The recent agreement that was reached to allow the export of grain from Ukrainian ports is one ray of hope that can lead to more. It is high time for peace to return to the heart of our priorities. In conclusion, my country once again calls on the parties to firmly commit to negotiations in good faith with the goal of silencing the guns and bringing peace to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Gabon for his statement. I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Secretary General Antonio Guterres and Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for their updates on the situation in Ukraine. Kenya takes this opportunity to convey our best wishes to President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine on their Independence Day. We regret that what should be a day of celebration is impaired by a war that has breached Ukraine's territorial integrity contrary to the fundamental principles of the UN Charter. The people of Ukraine have suffered greatly these past six months. We offer them, and particularly the bereaved families, our deepest condolences. Mr. President, Ukraine's Independence Day gives us an opportunity to appreciate our own independence, as I am sure is the case for every member of this assembly. We will forever be thankful for the brave men and women who fought for our freedom. We joined the UN within days of becoming independent. We signed up to its principles because as a young nation, we needed assurance that our sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence would be respected. We valued its mission to outlaw aggression, to use its instruments to help us turn our swords into plowshares so that we could enjoy the fruits of our freedom. We remain thankful that this United Nations stood for decolonization, that it gave voice to the smallest countries in the world without regard to their military might or wealth. What a precious heritage we have and how intolerable that it should be as endangered as it is today. We are forced by this moment to recall how its failed predecessor, the League of Nations, was unable to stop the conflicts that led to the great fire of World War II. Multilateralism as expressed in the United Nations, including in this venerated chamber, with all its flaws, is our last hope against a new world war. The wars we choose to fight as Kenya and Africa, as I believe is the case for most of the world, are for independence from poverty, ignorance, and disease. We have no desire to be drawn into a worldwide conflict or for our grievances and disagreements to be the soil in which wars by proxy take root. We see in Ukraine's war a grim warning that we too may be engulfed by the competitions and confrontations that are contributing to its ferocity. That is why we believe that Ukraine's immediate fate is so important to all of us. Ukraine deserves the same freedom and independence that we enjoy. It is a member of our UN in good standing. Its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence should be respected. Its people do not deserve to have their lives and livelihoods destroyed. Unless the Ukraine war is stopped through dialogue and negotiation, it could be the first of a series of conflicts that future historians will name the Third World War. Such a disaster would be different from the last wars 
and all the wars before them. The dangers of direct conflict between nuclear armed powers means that most of their confrontations would be undertaken by proxy. Africa and the rest of the world would be thrown into a mirror of the Cold War that shattered our democracies, overthrew and killed our leaders, and robbed us of decades of economic progress. Stopping this war in a manner that adheres to the principles of the UN Charter is what will keep other old grievances from boiling over. Mr. President, not all is lost. Even in such dark times, we must remember that in the past, serious threats to international peace and security have been successfully resolved. There is yet a chance to build on the slim but important success represented by the agreement between the parties for the secure export of Ukraine's food products through the Black Sea, as well as food and fertilizer exports from Russia. We commend the Secretary General and the government of Takie for their crucial facilitation. The willingness of the parties to negotiate and the alertness, subtle skill, and moral persuasion of the facilitators demonstrate that diplomacy is still able to deliver if given a chance. We cannot leave our fate to the most powerful. Some of them may be bent on domination, but, but we cannot allow it to be at the expense of our common peace. They may project certainty and great power, but none can know or control the future. It is time for intuitive, bold leadership from any and every country that has influence or leverage to push them to dialogue rather than confrontation. The immediate aim should be for cessation of hostilities in Ukraine, the opening of safe humanitarian corridors and unhindered humanitarian access, and the security of all nuclear installations, especially the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. These should be part of a roadmap to achieving a comprehensive agreement that secures the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Such an end, given the emerging escalation between the great powers, would ideally be linked to a broader negotiation that produces a stable European security order. The principles underlying such an order should adhere to the UN Charter and be utilized to stabilize other parts of the world. In the meantime, Kenya, while in the Security Council and in all relevant forums, will offer every support to positive efforts seeking these aims. We will continue to champion the cause of the Secretary General and his team, who need to be commended for their tireless efforts. In this, in this regard, we applaud his recent visit to Lviv. We also pay tribute to the determined efforts by the UN's agencies, funds, and programs to provide humanitarian aid and comfort to Ukraine's most vulnerable. Their impact is evidence of a depth of competence that we hope is resourced and deployed with equal ambition in other conflict areas. Mr. President, we know that even with a gravely threatened multilateralism, as reflected in this downcast Security Council, a spirit of urgency and imagination can still allow us to forge a just peace for Ukraine. I wish for all Ukrainians their continued independence, as I reaffirm Kenya's respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. I thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement. Now I give the floor to the representative of UAE. Thank you, Mr. President. And at the outset, I would like to thank the Secretary General for his opening remarks and Under Secretary General Di Carlo for her valuable briefing. I want to also express our gratitude to the Secretary General and his team for effective use of his good offices. As the Secretary General said in Odessa, the ships that left Ukrainian ports over the last month carrying grain are indeed vessels of hope. I also thank President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine for his briefing, and I'd like to join my colleagues in congratulating President Zelensky and all Ukrainians for their country's Independence Day. 
Today, we mark six months since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, and it is difficult to overstate the toll it has had. The dead, the injured, for those remaining in the country, and those forced to flee. A staggering one-third of Ukrainians have been displaced from their homes, and 6.6 .6 million have sought refuge across Europe. Beyond Ukraine's borders, the conflict has exacerbated food insecurity and the rise in commodity prices, both of which add to the daily hardship suffered by hundreds of millions of people around the world. The UAE strongly applauds the agreements brokered with the support of the Secretary General and the Republic of Turkey to facilitate the export of grain, food supplies and fertilizers to global markets. This rare example of tangible progress cannot, however, be the last. It must incentivize more concerted efforts to mitigate the impact of this conflict on the lives of those most in need and hopefully ensure that we are not here six months from now marking a year of conflict and further global disruption. Mr. President, the UN Charter provides a repertoire of tools to address the peaceful settlement of disputes none of which are applicable in the absence of the political will to use them. In turn, this requires us, all of us, to recognize that the war will only end through a negotiated settlement and that all wars must eventually end as they have done countless times in human history. There is value in the Council's meetings on Ukraine when they're complemented with action, laser focused on alleviating the suffering of civilians and finding a political path to this war's end. We cannot change the past, but what happens next is a responsibility we all share. In the last few weeks, we have seen signs of progress, particularly the agreements on agricultural exports. We've also taken positive note of the parties' expressed support for the IAEA to send a mission to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And we urgently reiterate that this must happen as the Secretary General has said, the warning lights are flashing and failure to act could be grave. These initiatives all have the potential as confidence building measures that could unlock broader political discussions. And we need to work hard to preserve and expand these windows towards viable diplomatic initiatives aimed at de-escalation and resolution. Mr. President, a peaceful, sustainable resolution relies ultimately on the UN Charter and international law as our guiding principle. Six months in, our call for a cessation of hostilities throughout Ukraine is as relevant as it has ever been. We cannot become inured to this war. The stakes are too high, every life is too precious. The conflict should end now, and we need to see leaders from both sides commit to charting that difficult path forward with all of our support. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of UAE for her statement. Now I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. I thank you, Mr. President. I welcome the participation in this meeting of President Zelensky and other Rule 39 participants. We wish Ukraine best wishes on their Independence Day. I also express thanks to the Secretary General for his pertinent briefing on the humanitarian and security situation in Ukraine and join others in commending his direct involvement in the multiple mediation efforts aimed at getting the Russian Federation and Ukraine to cease their military hostilities and to positively engage in dialogue. I affirm in that regard Ghana's full support for the continuous deployment of the SG's good offices in helping to bring lasting peace to the people of Ukraine. Mr. President, the Black Sea Grain Initiative and the agreement on promoting the access of Russian food products and fertilizers to world markets, both secured under the auspices of the United Nations with the active facilitation by other key actors have proven that with persistent diplomacy, an acceptable political solution could be found to the ongoing military hostilities in Ukraine. Now more than ever, we must seize on the positive momentum generated by these two outcomes and intensify efforts to find other avenues to significantly diffuse the dangerously escalating tensions. 
Indeed, since the initial lien on July 27th and the subsequent implementation, the maritime humanitarian corridor in the Black Sea created by the initiative has enabled more than 500,000 metric tons of grain and other foodstuffs to be evacuated from Ukraine's south imports to various parts of the world, which hitherto had been reeling under the threat of hunger and food insecurity. We urge the members of this council to overcome their persistent divide and work in a constructive manner to bring the weight of the council's authority in support of such initiatives. Mr. President, the mounting debt toll and the destruction to economic infrastructure in Ukraine remain a matter of deep concern to Ghana. The deliberate targeting of nuclear facilities meant for peaceful purposes has further heightened our fears that a dangerous phase has begun in this senseless war. We stress the need for the parties to heed our genuine calls, including that of the international community, to end the war. Further, we urge the demilitarization of all the zones around Ukraine's nuclear facilities and affirm our support for international inspectors to be allowed access to the facilities in line with established norms. Beyond the fact that there is no military solution to the substantive security concerns of the parties, the war is unfortunately accentuating geopolitical tensions in many areas, exerting further strain on the already fragile international order. We share the conviction that any miscalculation could potentially result in a wider conflict in Europe with long-term irreparable damage to the global peace and security architecture. We therefore continue to urge maximum restraint on the part of all the key actors and for an unconditional respect of the obligations imposed by the Charter. In that regard, we encourage all parties to the conflict to seek Pacific settlement as there should be no question about the need to respect international law which underpins the current rules-based international order. Mr. President, in conclusion, we wish to underscore that it is crucial for the lives and safety of civilians, particularly women and children, caught up in the ongoing war to be prioritized above every other consideration. We therefore renew our call on the Russian Federation to withdraw all its invading troops from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine and pursue diplomacy and dialogue to resolve its legitimate security concerns. I thank you. I thank you. And I would like to give the floor to the representative of India. Mr. President, we thank the Secretary General for his comprehensive briefing on his visit to Ukraine last week. We thank USD Di Carlo for, the, for her intervention. I also join my foreign minister in conveying our greetings today to the people of Ukraine on the occasion of their Independence Day. As we meet to mark six months since the beginning of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, India is ready to dispatch its 12th consignment of humanitarian aid to Ukraine, consisting of 26 types of medicines, including hemostatic bandages, meant to stem the bleeding of deep wounds in children and adults. This was a specific request by the Ukrainian side, and we have made sure that we, we will be reacting in the fastest possible time to meet this. In the last six months, India has dispatched 11 consignments of approximately 97.5 tons of humanitarian aid to Ukraine and neighboring countries, such as Romania, Moldova, Slovakia, and Poland. Ukraine and its neighboring countries had offered their full support in the relief and evacuation operation of around 22,500 Indian nationals in February, March this year. This humanitarian aid and assistance symbolizes the human-centric development approach of the government of India, a central tenet of our national beliefs and values, which perceives the whole world as one family. India remains deeply concerned over the situation in Ukraine. The conflict has resulted in loss of lives and countless miseries for its peoples, particularly for women, children, and the elderly, with millions becoming homeless and forced to take shelter in neighboring countries. We believe that going forward, 
we need to focus on the following aspects. One, in terms of diplomacy, India continues to advocate for an immediate cessation of hostilities and an end to violence. We encourage talks between Ukraine and Russia. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has himself more than once spoken to them in this regard. Two, the ground situation calls for sustained prioritization of urgent humanitarian relief. I have just elaborated that we continue to give the highest priority to the requests that we receive in this regard. We also reiterate the importance of the UN guiding principles of humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian action must always be guided by the principles of humanitarian assistance, that is, humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. These measures should never be politicized. Three, we will work with the international community and partner countries to mitigate the economic hardships that are resulting from this conflict. The impact of the Ukraine conflict is not just limited to Europe, exacerbating concerns over food, fertilizer, and fuel security, particularly in the developing countries. Four, food security remains a major concern. It is necessary for all of us to adequately appreciate the importance of equity, affordability, and accessibility when it comes to food grains. India has been approached for the supply of wheat and sugar by many countries, and we are responding positively. In the last three months alone, India has exported more than 1.8 million tons of wheat to countries in need, including to Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan, and Yemen. Five, we are also trying to increase the production of essential agrarian inputs like fertilizers in India. There is also a need to focus on the availability of fertilizers and keep the supply chains of fertilizers smooth at a global scale. Six, efforts should be made to ensure stability in the global supply of fuel commensurate with demand. Open markets must not become an argument to perpetuate inequity and promote discrimination. Seven, we have delivered for the world in terms of vaccines. We did it earlier for medicines. So I would like to assure this council that India will step forward whenever the global south is constrained on aspects of food, health, and energy security. And we will do this in a manner that is helpful to the global economy and does not take undue advantage of countries in distress. To conclude, India's approach will be to promote dialogue and diplomacy with an overarching aim to end the conflict and work with other partners to mitigate the economic challenges emerging from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Mr. President, it is in our collective interest to work constructively, both inside the United Nations and outside, seeking an early resolution to this conflict. We continue to reiterate that the global order be anchored on international law, the UN Charter, and respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. Thank you. I thank the representative of India for her statement. Now I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Mr. President, regarding the statement by the President of Ukraine, the reason the Security Council at one point decided not to involve foreign leaders by VTC also lies in seeking to avoid technical difficulties, which we just witnessed during Mr. Zelensky's statement. It was very difficult to make out anything that was said at all at certain points. We hope that our p position regarding the usefulness of in-person participation of guests, at the very least out of respect for them, has become clearer as a result of this to those following today's meeting. Mr. President, yesterday, we gathered here yesterday in connection with a concrete threat to international peace and security, namely Kiev's ongoing bombing of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is putting Europe on the brink of a nuclear catastrophe. We took note of the explanations of the Secretary General for why he did not take part in yesterday's meeting. Today's meeting, however, is formally not related to developments on the ground at all and is meant to demonstrate the unfailing support of Western delegations for 
any actions of the Kiev regime. We have predictably heard plenty of mantras about Russian aggression. As we have already said, over the past 200 years, no other explanation for European security issues except for references to Russia's actions has emerged in the West. Today, we also heard many claims about the catastrophic consequences of six months of hostilities for the civilian population of Ukraine. No one is arguing that it is difficult for Ukrainians today. However, the responsibility for this lies with the Kiev regime, which came to power in 2014 as a result of an anti-constitutional coup carried out with the help of a number of Western states. From the very beginning, the new Maidan authorities have been steadily leading the country to disaster, choosing the path of Russophobia and the glorification of Nazi criminals. Thus, according to the most conservative estimates, more than 60% of the population of Ukraine was deprived of the opportunity to realize their Russian-speaking identity, contrary to all relevant international conventions and Ukraine's obligations. Their Western backers, blinded by the geopolitical goal of weakening Russia, made it clear from the beginning they would cover up any crimes committed by the Kiev authorities and turn a blind eye to things that they would never allow in their own countries. The Kiev regime fully demonstrated its criminal nature when it burnt dissenters alive in the House of Trade Unions in Odessa and dropped bombs and shells on the civilian population of Donbass. In this senseless crusade against itself, Ukraine lost Crimea and provoked armed resistance from Donetsk and Lugansk residents who took up arms in the name of freedom and the future of their children. This war, which claimed the lives of civilians for eight years, could have ended if Kiev had fulfilled the Minsk agreements. However, Neither the Ukrainian authorities nor their foreign patrons needed this. They openly stated this once again at the beginning of this year while threatening to abandon their non-nuclear status. In such a context, in order to establish peace in the Donbass and to prevent the obvious threats to Russia emanating from Ukraine, we had no choice but to launch a special operation to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine the goals of which are being successfully and steadily fulfilled. I repeat once again, if the Minsk agreements had been implemented, no special operation would have been needed. But the regime in Kiev decided otherwise. The criminal shelling of the republics of Donbass continues. In the Donetsk People's Republic, more than 840 people are estimated to have died on the line of contact since the beginning of the escalation in February, about 2,800 injured. In the Luhansk People's Republic, 80 people were killed and more than 250 were injured. Approximately 100 civilians have been killed in just four weeks since the previous meeting on July 29th. The armed forces of Ukraine are purposefully destroying civilian infrastructure, including kindergartens, schools, and medical facilities, power lines, and ga gas pipelines. They do not spare even those cities in Donbass that until recently were under their control, such as Lysychansk, for example. And our former Western partners, instead of condemning their Ukrainian mentees, are supplying them with more and more new types of weapons, which reach areas that Kiev could not previously reach. In doing this, they are becoming accomplices in crimes against the civilian population. And Given that the use of some artillery systems, as the Ukrainians themselves admit, is impossible without coordinating the targets with suppliers, they are becoming co-perpetrators as well. This primarily concerns the American HIMARS multiple launch rocket systems, which were used, for instance, to strike the correctional facility in Yelenivka on July 29th, claiming the lives of more than 50 Ukrainian prisoners of war. We know that the president of Ukraine is well aware of the fact that it is the armed forces of Ukraine who are behind this crime, despite the fact that he sold us a false version today of Russia being responsible for this. Mr. President, from the very beginning, we warned that Ukrainian armed groups were actively using civilian facilities for military purposes. Meanwhile, local residents are prohibited from leaving their homes and all their attempts to independently evacuate to safe areas are brutally suppressed. There have been so many 
incidents of Ukrainian artillery and ammunition being situated on the territory of educational and medical facilities over these six months that even pro-Western human rights organizations such as Amnesty International can no longer ignore them. However, instead of forcing Kyiv to comply with international humanitarian law, our Western colleagues, after the tantrum thrown by Ukrainian authorities who are used to getting away with everything, chose to publicly castigate Amnesty International itself instead. And today, Ms. DiCarlo found words to express concern in connection with the upcoming trial of Azov Nazis and sadists, but said nothing of the horrific crimes they committed and their violations of international humanitarian law, including brutal torture, information regarding which is uh, available to the international civil service community and including Ms. DiCarlo herself. And the United Nations has f enough information about this as well, the UN whom Ms. DiCarlo represents. This all, frankly, looks extremely uh, cynical and denigrates the values of freedom of speech. Uh, and it's a shame that you don't understand this. But ordinary Ukrainians are well aware of this. They encounter the atrocities of the armed forces of Ukraine and the national battalions and their inhumane ma methods. Let me cite just one example. At the meeting in July, we already showed you a photo of the Lepestock or Petal anti-personnel mine. Today, for greater clarity, I will show you the training models for these mines, which Ukrainian troops scatter by the hundreds in the Donbass in the territories liberated by the Russian army and even throw them into the territory of Russia. Imagine such an inconspicuous petal lying on the ground in the grass. It can also be camouflage colored, which makes it virtually invisible on the ground. Considering that the Ukrainian armed forces scatter these mines in towns and villages far behind the front lines, it is not soldiers that they pose a threat to at all. No, they are purposefully designed to target civilians, especially children who risk stepping on them or picking up such a toy out of curiosity. 47 explosions of such mines have already been recorded in the Donetsk People's Republic. This Petal Mine is living proof of the sadistic, savage nature of the Ukrainian regime and a symbol of its true attitude towards the people of the east and southeast of the country. And of course, the people see and understand this, hence the treatment of Russian soldiers as liberators, which is widespread in the liberated territories. This in no way fits into the narrative promoted by Kyiv and its Western sponsors. Ukraine is therefore resorting to terror and intimidation tactics in the Kherson, Zaporizhia, and Kharkiv regions. But this cannot change the minds of people who have seen the true face of the Kiev regime. Kiev is losing the battle for mines and its Western backers who are waging a proxy war against Russia to the last Ukrainian are getting mired deeper and deeper in supporting this anti-popular, anti-human regime turning a blind eye to manifestations of neo-Nazism, extreme nationalism, and Russophobia. They are also shooting themselves in the foot with futile attempts to isolate Russia politically and economically. Then again, that is something you will have to answer for to your own voters and taxpayers. As you will have to answer to the international community for the unprecedented mendation campaign to discredit Russia that you have unleashed. Never before since Nazi Goebbels propaganda has uh, Russia, uh, has the world encountered such a degree of falsification which Western and Ukrainian PSYOPs experts are using. There is no doubt that history will be able to give the correct assessment to all this. Our Albanian colleague propounded today Al Albanez about Russian prisoners that are allegedly being recruited by the Russian authorities. However, he forgot to mention those released from Ukrainian prisons, Ukrainian prisoners who were handed out weapons in the very first days of the special military operation and who became, made themselves known by pillaging and murders and continued to terrorize Ukrainian towns. We will go into this in detail at one of the future meetings of the council. Mr. President, the so-called Black Sea Initiative of the UN Secretary General is considered to be a sort of success story, especially in terms of the unhindered export of food from Ukraine. However, there are alarming trends here as well. Over the four weeks of export operations, only one of the 34 dry cargo ships went to Africa. 
This is completely inconsistent with the originally stated goal of combating hunger in countries in dire need of grain. Here, of course, it is also worth recalling the public image failure with the sending of the first vessel, Rizzoni, which essentially, instead of bringing long-awaited wheat to Lebanon, brought corn instead and corn for animal feed at that. In this context, there is much to think about regarding the comment made by the Secretary General in the port of Odessa on August 19th when he said that grain exports and reduced prices on global markets will not bring relief to needy countries who cannot afford to buy them anyway. This situation clearly reveals the true causes of global food security issues. Ukrainian grain has nothing to do with it. The main reason is Western countries' own economic miscalculations and the consequences of anti-Russian sanctions, which we've repeatedly spoken about in this chamber. It was the sanctions that ruptured logistical and financial chains, which in turn provoked a sharp drop in market supplies. Supply Excuses about the supposedly targeted nature of unilateral measures cannot fill hungry people's stomachs. We call on all those involved to take the package nature of the Black Sea Initiative with full seriousness and not to postpone resolving the financial and logistical problems that impede the export of Russian food and fertilizers to the global market. We emphasize that the extension of the Green Deal, the term of which is 120 days from the date of signing, would be facilitated by tangible results for Russian foreign trade operators equivalent to those we are seeing for Ukrainian exports. So far, there are still significant reserves in this part of the Green Deal. Mr. President, it is no secret that the Western colleagues who requested today's meeting were resolved to have it coincide with the Independence Day of Ukraine. Much has been said about this today. A number of our colleagues directly point to Russia as a threat to Ukrainian independence. We cannot agree with this. Eight years after the launch of the Maidan project, it has become obvious that the main and in fact the only threat to the independence of Ukraine is the current government in Kyiv. Over these years, robust mechanisms have been formed for the external governance of Ukraine, which are visible to the naked eye. We know that at all levels of government, in all the key agency of this country, agencies of this country, there are Western advisors without whose concurrence not a single major decision is made. It is enough to recall how, in 2014, the notorious Victoria Nuland resolved issues regarding the formation of the Ukrainian government by phone with the American ambassador in Kyiv, or recall the current president of the United States, Joe Biden, boasting that he had used cr crude blackmail to remove the prosecutor general of Ukraine. If this is independence, then what is dependence? And is there anything for Ukrainians to celebrate on this day? Throughout Zelensky's reign, and particularly since February 24th, the opposition has been completely eliminated in the country. Dissent has been suppressed. Opposition media have been shut down. People are being persecuted, arrested, and put in prison just for reading Russian language news and watching Russian channels. And now, in accordance with the new law on collaborationism, they are also being imprisoned for accepting humanitarian assistance for Ukraine, from Russia. Ukraine has become fully transformed into a backwards, ruthless anti-Russia and is confidently moving towards a complete ideological and political bankruptcy. In order to assess the degree of this profound Russophobic degradation, I would like to once again quote the words said the other day by Ukrainian ambassador to Kazakhstan, Petro Verblevsky. After the murder of Daria Dugina, he openly declared, and I quote, we are trying to kill as many of them as possible. The more Russians we kill now, the fewer our children will have to kill. That's all. End of quote. And this was said by the ambassador of a country in which these same Russians not only live, but make up a very significant part of the population. Does such a country and such an inhumane regime have a future? Our Western colleagues can prolong its agony, but they cannot prevent its fiasco. Therefore, in conclusion, I would like to express my wish for the brotherly people of Ukraine to finally gain freedom and the opportunity to build a society that would respect fundamental human rights and national identity and would live in peace with its neighbors. That hour is already close, despite all the efforts of the Kiev regime and its Western patrons. Thank you. I thank the uh, representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I give the floor to the representative from Mexico. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, my delegation thanks the Secretary General 
and the USG for their briefings. We've listened with great interest and with profound respect to the statement delivered by President Zelensky of Ukraine, whose independence we are celebrating today, tomorrow, and forever. We've also followed very closely and with a great deal of attention the recent visits by the Secretary General to Ukraine and Turkey. We recognize his leadership and his efforts, which have led to important agreements, in particular to mitigate the impact of the food crisis and to give us back hope. In this regard, we welcome the fact that the Black Sea Grain Initiative continues to operate on a regular basis and it is made possible the delivery of 720,000 metric tons of grain to markets throughout the world as well as to the World Food Program supplies. All of this appears ultimately and finally to be having an important stabilizing impact. Mexico believes that progress within the framework of this Black Sea Grain Initiative is a major diplomatic milestone in very difficult times. In this regard, I'd also like to recognize the extremely important work of the President of Turkey in facilitating this agreement. Once again, we urge all parties, in particular those with the capacity to influence, to spare no efforts in order to keep the channels of communication open so as to establish dialogue and put an end to hostilities. But despite this progress, it is clear that the multilateral system, in particular the Security Council, have not been able to put an end to this war. The invasion of a sovereign country, Ukraine, by Russia is a flagrant violation of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. Any territorial acquisition resulting from the illegal use of force is null and void. We must put an end to the war and with that an end to the many violations of international law, in particular international humanitarian law. Six months of bombings on hospitals, schools, residential areas, on basic civilian infrastructure including the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the destruction of cultural heritage. Six months of violations of the methods and means of warfare, of violations of human rights, including sexual and gender-based violence, and the indiscriminate use of weapons the use of indiscriminate weapons such as cluster munitions and mines, we most emphatically call for an end to these attacks, in particular those directed against the civilian population and indiscriminate attacks. And we also call upon the parties to comply with the principles of distinction, proportionality and precautionary measures in conducting hostilities. We express our greatest support for the inquiries being carried out by the prosecutor of the ICC as well as the fact-finding mission to determine the facts with regard to the alleged war crimes which have taken place in Olenivka. Accountability is a fundamental pillar of our multilateral system and those responsible for these crimes that have been committed and which are being committed in Ukraine must be brought to justice. Mr. President, Mexico reiterates our deep concern at the threat posed by illicit flows of weapons and trafficking of weapons in the region. We must maintain monitoring over the full life cycle of weapons from their transfer through brokering and concluding with 
the end users of those weapons. We must focus our action to ensure that weapons do not fall in the hands of those who should never have them, particularly when hostilities are over. The work of Mexico in this Council will continue to focus on working towards and solidifying peace in Ukraine. Along these lines, I'd like to reiterate our urgent appeal to negotiate a cessation of hostilities and to seek a solution through dialogue and diplomacy. I would conclude by reaffirming our support for the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within internationally recognized borders. These principles are enshrined in the UN Charter, and all of us here have committed to respecting and upholding these principles. Thank you. I thank the representative of Mexico for their statement. I shall make, now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of China. Colleagues, China's position on the Ukraine issue is consistent and clear. We always maintain that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should, re should be respected. The purposes and principles of the UN Charter upheld the legitimate security concerns of all countries taken seriously and all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement of the crisis supported. However, the Ukraine crisis is still ongoing. The fighting is still expanding with growing spillover effects. The prospect of peace has yet to materialize. The international community eagerly awaits the early resumption of peace. They also expect the Security Council to play its due role toward this end. What we need to reflect on is, has the Council found the right direction toward solving the issue? Has the Council made earnest efforts to ease the situation? China is ready to work with all peace-loving countries to promote peace and dialogue and facilitate the easing of the situation. At present, the priority, in our opinion, should be the following points. First, there is a need to set up a safety valve for the conflict. The international humanitarian law should guide the conduct of parties to the conflict. Civilians and civilian facilities cannot be the targets of military strikes. Recently, frequent attacks on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant have led to extensive attention and concerns, casting a nuclear shadow over the world. China calls on, once again, all relevant parties to exercise restraint, act with caution, refrain from any action that may compromise the safety and security of the nuclear facility, and avoid crossing the nuclear safety red line. We also expect the IAEA to conduct a site visit to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as soon as possible to make a professional and technical assessment of the situation so as to take follow-up measures to prevent a nuclear disaster. Second, there is a need to reduce the humanitarian impacts as much as possible. The international community should, on the one hand, make efforts to help Ukrainian refugees and displaced persons tide over the difficulties, and on the other hand, reduce the impacts of the conflict on the global food, energy, and financial stability. China commends Secretary General Guterres and relevant parties for their efforts to facilitate the Grain Export Agreement. We are pleased to see that over 20 ships carrying over 700,000 tons of food have left Ukraine for multiple destinations around the world. This goes a long way toward curbing rising food prices, stabilizing the international food market, and easing the food shortages in developing countries. 
at the same time, removing barriers to the export of food and fertilizers from Russia is also highly important. We hope that the UN can, in accordance with its MOU with Russia, help address the chilling effect caused by relevant countries' abuse of sanctions and ensure the stable and smooth running of the global industrial chain and supply chain. These are challenging times for developing countries. Cutting ODA will only make things worse. Developed countries should face up to the humanitarian impacts of such cuts and adopt responsible policies and measures. Third, there is a need to leave an exit ramp for diplomatic solutions. Peace can never be achieved by imposing sanctions and pressure or sending weapons. Peace must be fought for and maintained by all parties working together. No matter how complex the situation is, how serious the differences are, the door to diplomacy and dialogue cannot be closed. The positive progress on the issue of grain export shows us the potential of diplomacy and the possibility of a political solution. We hope that Russia and Ukraine continue the dialogue communication between them so as to return to diplomatic negotiations at an early date and create momentum and conditions needed for a ceasefire. The U.S. and NATO should seriously reflect on the roles they have been playing and focus their efforts on what truly is conducive to peace instead of pouring oil over fire. Colleagues, the Ukraine crisis and a series of recent tense developments around the world show that in this era that urgently needs solidarity and cooperation to collectively address challenges, we must be highly vigilant against any deliberate attempts to provoke troubles and intensify division and confrontation. And we must safeguard the global strategic st stability. We should never allow the world to slide into a new Cold War. Facts have proven that the Cold War mentality and block confrontation must be firmly rejected. In over 30 years after the end of the Cold War, NATO keeps expanding eastward, which doesn't make Europe safer, but has sowed the seed of conflict. We, humanity, are living in an indivisible secure security community, and common security is in the utmost common interest of all countries. Security of a country should not come at the expense of that of another country, and security of a region cannot be realized by beefing up military blocks. Today, in the 21st century, the Cold War mentality and zero-sum game are long outdated concepts. Obsessing over military force and seeking absolute security will only lead to constant escalation of the regional situation, which is not in the interest of any party. Facts have proven that Decoupling and choosing sides must be firmly rejected. The economies around the world are deeply integrated. Certain countries wantonly impose unilateral sanctions, exercise long-arm jurisdiction, politicize and weaponize economy, trade, and technology, insist on decoupling and building small yard high fence, which have led to further difficulties in people's livelihood in developing countries and threaten the global food, energy, and finance security. Developing countries should not be made to bear the brunt of geopolitical conflicts and major country rivalry. They have the right to independently decide their foreign policies and should not be forced to choose sides. Facts have proven that double standard and selective application must be firmly rejected. Upholding the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity should not be just quoted. 
all countries should actually abide by these principles in practice and should have consistency on different issues involving different countries while matching their words with deeds. With regard to state sovereignty and territorial integrity, the Chinese people have deep understanding of and strong feelings about it through first-hand experience. China consistently respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other countries and is determined to firmly safeguard its own sovereignty and territorial integrity. The Ukraine crisis is a major test of our generation's ability to maintain peace. Standing at this historical crossroads, what do we want to have? Peace or turmoil? Cooperation or confrontation? Progress or regression? We must make the right choice, a choice worthy of the people's trust and of our times. I resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Silvio Gonzato, Shangzhi, the Fair and the Interim of the Delegation of the European Union to the United Nations. Thank you. President, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the European Union and its 27 member states. The candidate countries North Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, and the Republic of Moldova, the country of the stabilization and association process and potential candidate Bosnia Herzegovina, Georgia, Andorra, and San Marino align themselves with this statement. President, we welcome today's discussion on Ukraine. It is essential that the Security Council remain seized of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. I thank the Secretary General and Under Secretary General Di Carlo for their briefings and welcome the intervention by President Zelensky at this meeting. First of all, let me congratulate Ukraine on the 31st anniversary of its independence. The fact that today also marks the sixth month since Russia's unprovoked and illegal aggression provides a stark reminder that independence can never be taken for granted. The EU recognizes the tremendous courage displayed by Ukraine and its people in defense of its independence. As the Under Secretary General told us, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has verified over 13,000 civilian casualties since Russia's attack, with the true numbers being considerably higher. We express our deepest sympathy to the families of the victims and reaffirm our commitment to continuing our support to Ukraine in any way we can. The EU reiterates its strongest condemnation for the continued violation by Russia of the UN Charter as well as its disregard of the United Nations General Assembly resolutions adopted in March this year by an overwhelming majority of UN members. We also deplore Russia's failure to comply with the legally binding order of the International Court of Justice to immediately cease its use of force against Ukraine. And we call upon the Russian Federation to comply with its obligation under international law, including the UN Charter, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. The perpetrators of war crimes and of other serious violations, as well as the responsible government officials and military representatives, will be held accountable. The EU actively supports all measures to ensure accountability for human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian law committed during the Russian aggression in Ukraine. President, the past months we have seen an emerging risk of nuclear calamity in Europe. It is deplorable that we even need to say that a nuclear power plant should never be used as a military base. The deployment of Russian military personnel and weaponry at the nuclear facility is unacceptable and disregards the safety, security, and safeguard principles that all IEEA members have committed to respect. We urge the Russian Federation to immediately withdraw its military forces and all other unauthorized personnel from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and its immediate surroundings, so that the operator and Ukrainian authorities can resume their sovereign responsibilities within Ukraine's international recognized borders, and so that the legitimate operating staff can conduct their duties without outside interference, threat, or unacceptably harsh working conditions. An IAEA mission 
urgently needs to enter the power plant to address nuclear safety, security, and safeguard concerns in a manner that respects full Ukrainian sovereignty and its control over its, its territory and infrastructure. IAEA staff must be able to access all nuclear facilities in Ukraine safely and without impediment, and engage directly and without interference with Ukrainian personnel responsible for the operation of these facilities. The global implications of Russian's aggression are well documented, Mr. President. We support the UN's Global Crisis Response Group, launched in the aftermath of Russia's invasion with a view to addressing rocketing food and energy prices. We welcome the progress made in implementing the Black Sea Grain Initiative and reiterate our gratitude to the Secretary General and Turkey for facilitating its agreement and acknowledge the positive role played by other ac actors, such as the African Union leadership, in coming to an arrangement. We call for continued strict implementation of the Black Sea Grain Initiative with a view to addressing rising food prices globally. With our Solidarity Lanes Initiative, aimed at boosting exports from Ukraine over land, the EU is proud to have contributed to increasing Ukrainian exports of cereals, oil seeds, and related products from 1.3 million tons in April to 2.8 million tons in July. We're also supporting agricultural production and resilience in the most affected countries. The EU welcome, welcomes the active involvement of the Secretary General. His recent visit to Ukraine and Istanbul demonstrate his dedication to address this crisis, and the EU will continue to support his efforts and those of his staff, including the Joint Coordination Center. We welcome the Secretary General's calls to demilitarize the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as well as the establishment of a fact-finding mission to investigate the incident in a detention facility in Olenivka. President, in conclusion, the UN's member states reaffirmed their commitment to the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within, within its international recognized borders and extending to its territorial sea. President, this war is senseless. The humanitarian consequences for millions of civilians are disastrous. Russia could end it tomorrow if it wanted. Until that happens, human lives are wasted and the war's global fallout continues at a time in history where we should focus on the planetary crises which are impacting us all. This is why we reiterate our demand for the immediate cessation of the military aggression against Ukraine by the Russian Federation, as well as for the full, immediate and unconditional withdrawal of its forces and military equipment from Ukraine's territory. In the meantime, we wish to assure our partners around the world that the EU will continue to demonstrate its global solidarity to address the impacts of Russian's aggression, especially on the most vulnerable. I thank you. I thank His Excellency, uh, the representative from the EU for his statement. There are no other names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.